Good afternoon. It is Saturday the 24th around quarter to four in the afternoon. I'm finally getting to the sermon. It's been a, an interesting last few hours. I didn't get to sleep till about four because <clears throat> Humpy's been wrestling with his feline acne and so there were some issues I had to take care of. So he woke me up this morning around 11. He had to go outside and didn't want to use the litter box. So up I got. And my day has been going quite well. I have no complaints. <clears throat> this coming Sunday is the, tomorrow is the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. Yet another green Sunday. Will they ever end? Uh, yes, they will. When Advent gets here. So, why don't we get on to the topic at hand. The gospel comes to us from Matthew, and I'm only going to read the first part of it because the second part of it is kind of somewhat irrelevant as to what I want to say. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As I've talked about before, Rabbi Hillel lived about a century after our blessed Lord. And many of his teachings are similar to those of Jesus with a good helping of traditional Judaism thrown in. This was the time after the fall of the temple in 70 AD and the beginnings of what we now know as rabbinic Judaism based on Pharisaic Judaism. Now, the Pharisees get a really bad rap in the Gospels, but in fact, Jesus was a Pharisaic Jew himself, because the Pharisees were the only denomination within Judaism at that time that believed in resurrection. One day a disciple asked Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi, what is the essence of the Torah? And the wise Rabbi replied, very simple, love God, love your neighbor, the rest is commentary. And he was right, for if one boils down both Judaism and Christianity, as well as nearly all the other great religions in the world, one get, gets the same message, love God, love your neighbor. Some of you will remember the good old days of the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. At the beginning of the Eucharistic liturgy from the time of the second English prayer book in 1552 was sung the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments as a form of Kyrie. It went on forever, and trying to sing the responses while kneeling was certainly an effort. So it seems that the drafters of the first American prayer book in 1789 inserted the summary of the law after the Decalogue, which in later editions became an option to the commandments, thank God. You might remember that it read, Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This was followed by the Kyrie as we know it in our present liturgy. The Gloria, as a matter of fact, as you'll remember, did not follow immediately, but didn't happen until after the post-communion prayer. Archbishop Cranmer believing that we had no reason to rejoice until we had been shriven of our sins in the Lord's Supper. In our parish, we never sang or even said the Decalogue, as the rector loathed it. We also sang the Gloria in the correct place after the Kyrie, thus defying Archbishop Cranmer, Anglo-Catholics, you know, but enough about all that stuff. On to the meat of the matter. Truth is, I tend to think of the summary of the law, or we do, I think, 
as two commandments, but I think Jesus meant them as one single commandment. He was reframing what came out of the Old Testament. He's saying that loving God and loving neighbor are exactly the same thing. To be honest, God doesn't need our love. I know that sounds a bit harsh, but hear me out. God is not a being. God is pure being with a capital B. I don't know how it works on this thing. Itself. That's kind of a hard concept to wrap your mind around. I'll, I mean, I get that, because I do too. God is beyond any human conception. And God is the very essence of all that is in the universe beyond time and space. <coughs> God has no needs, wants, or desires. And the essence of pure being is love itself. As I've said many times before, God is not in need of a good psychiatrist because he doesn't get enough love. So Jesus tells us that to love God because we need to love God. We have a need to express and feel the love of God. Such love isn't just a warm, fuzzy emotion we get and then that we send out. Love is where the rubber meets the road. We love God by loving our neighbor as ourselves. Problem is that most humans have the problem that we don't love ourselves, and that gets passed on to our neighbor, which, of course, then makes all sorts of other problems. So the question becomes, who is my neighbor? We've been reading Jim Wallace's Christ in, in Crisis at the Thursday Book Club. Quite interesting conversations. Some really profound and, and deep stuff has come out of the conversations in response to the book. <clears throat> but Wallace says that according to Jesus, the test of who your neighbor is will be shown by how you treat someone who is different from you. It's easy to love those who are like us, who share the same values, the same faith, the, the same outlook on life as we do, share similar histories and pasts. We understand these people. We understand where they're coming from. The point Jesus is making that if we truly love God, then we will also love those who are most different from us. Yes, I'm kind of busy at the moment. Coming up. I have company. Actually, it's not company, it's family. <clears throat> the point Jesus is making is that if we truly love God, then we will also love those who are most different from us because they too are created in the divine image. When we love them, then we are also loving God too. If we look at the present and the divides in our nation and our world at this very moment, it's pretty obvious that most humans do not really love God. This isn't a judgment, it's rather an observation. I can't condemn these people <clears throat> because in so doing, I'd be condemning myself. The racism and classism, the xenophobia and Islamophobia, the tossing away of the needy and the poor, the disregard for human life and the total ignorance of the massively wealthy who worship the almighty dollar rather than God, these people do not love God. In essence, they spit on the divine image and worship at the temple of greed. And at least to me, they are loathsome. They do not deserve my love. So there. And I say so there, and then the Holy Spirit taps me on the shoulder and gives me that look. She's good at that look, you know. She doesn't scold. Rather, she asks me, <clears throat> and what do you think makes people that way? 
put on the glasses of compassion, not pity, but compassion, and look at them with love. And what do you see? So what I do is I'm instructed by the third person of the ever blessed Trinity. And what I see is people who live in abject, in the abject poverty of fear. These people act and think the way they do because they fear losing what they have, not just their material possessions, which might even be a tertiary issue for them. What they're losing is their very sense of self, their very identities, identities that have been handed down to them through generations of fear, which have produced violence and hatred on a mass scale. They fear not being in control, they fear loneliness, they fear destitution, and they fear anything that threatens what they have or their very identity. And they manipulate Holy Writ to justify, if not elevate their beliefs and actions as if Jesus himself commands them to be as they are. At this point, <clears throat> my loathing of these people begins to crack. The light from the glasses through which the Spirit has asked me to view them shifts just a bit. I begin, I'll, begin, I'll admit it's just only a beginning, mind you, to ask her, what must it be like to live in that much fear? And she gently replies to me. She says, do the math, dear. When I do the math, my loathing of these people softens. I still don't like their behavior and their belief system. I still loathe those things, but my attitude towards these folks shifts. I ask the question the Spirit asked me, what must it be like to live in that much fear? And the only answer I can come, can come up with is that it must be sheer horror and terror. Then I begin to see that the problem is not with these people whose beliefs and actions I loathe. The problem, the problem is with me. I can't change them, but I can change me. And maybe some of my change can be a bridge. The challenge is to begin to see the image of God alive and well in these folks, which results in how I respond to them, even if I don't know any of them personally. I no longer respond in righteous indignation, no matter how justified it may be. In fact, I don't respond at all. I sit quietly and listen to their fear, their pain, their sheer horror, which they don't even recognize in themselves. My response, meager though it may be, is the beginning of loving God by loving my neighbor. But Wallace goes on to talk about something that I think is hard for many of us. He says that neighbors are not just, just those in our own sphere of influence. Neighbors, these total others, are those that we seek out those radically different from us, those we search out, those who find us just as loathsome as we find them. We search for them and we find them and we sit and listen. And when they're through spewing their fear, we respond in love. We tell of what it's like to live a life not based in fear, but rather in love and faith. And we do so without being patronizing or as if we're proclaiming to them the ultimate truth, even though we may be. We don't shove it down their throats. We stay our case and then wait for them to mull it over and then respond. And a conversation ensues. And God is present. And so is love. And what we begin to see is that there 
is far much more that unites us than divides us, that we share the same humanity. We are created in the same divine image, however we may express that. <clears throat> All of this is the snowflake on the tip of the iceberg, folks. Loving God by loving our neighbor is the hardest thing we will, we will ever do, but we are called by God in Christ to do so nonetheless. We're not required to get it perfect the first time or even the millionth time because we won't. But we're called to begin to put on different glasses and see our neighbor with compassion and love, the same compassion and love by which God sees them and sees us. Especially in these odd times, love is the only thing that will and is getting us through all of it. Because when we change the tint of our glasses, God is able to seep through and touch the ground on which we and our neighbor stands. We are called to love God so that God can make the divine self known and tangible and more than even real. As St. John says in his first epistle, we love because God first loved us. In the next few weird weeks as they unfold, I plan on tinting my glasses a bit more. And maybe the spirit will oblige me and wipe off some of the smudges so that I can see even more clearly and be more of God's love to my neighbor as Wallace defines. And I invite you to do the same. So that as time unfolds, we can see and respond in love rather than in our own fear. Respond by way of the love that is ours. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The links for Zoom Mass are in the email where you got the sermon. <clears throat> as is the bulletin and probably the lessons, if I get that far. Um, sorry about the interruption from you know who. He is now cleaning off his feline acne places. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day out. It's kind of blustery and fall-like and there are leaves all over the place and it's actually quite beautiful. I love fall. So go out and enjoy the day, sleep well, and I will see you tomorrow morning at 1030 at mass. Have a great day, bye.